I wanted to begin by reading this scripture, this, this psalm that's just full of an attitude of thankfulness, gratitude, and praise unto God. It's a good thing to remember who he is in this season. So I've invited my friend Elijah up. He's going to read first 11 uh, verses of Psalm 105. <laughs> psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Yes, sing praises to him. Mm. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. That's you guys. Come on, rejoice, rejoice. Thank you, Father. You're so worthy. You're so worthy, Father. And that's in us. <sighs> seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O oh, offsprings of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are all on the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. Forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statue, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. Saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. Amen. 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 Lord, we thank you that you're a God of promises, that you're a God of covenant commitment. And we just recognize you here together in this place. We recognize you for who you are, that you're a present God. You're not distant. You're not just a, a thought in, a, in an academic book based on history, but you're present. You're here with us right now. And so we surrender this time to you. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to speak to us, to have your way in and through us, to draw us to you, and to transform us from the inside out, that as we leave this place, we might leave the people that you desire that we would be. We commit to you this time in our hearts and our minds and our soul and our spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Grab a seat, grab a seat. So good to see all of you this weekend. Um, I want to propose a simple thought this morning as we jump in. Um, I think for as long as humanity has existed, people like you and I have looked up into the stars and, and asked a few simple questions. Number one, is there a God out there? Yeah. Does God exist? And number two, if there is a God, what is he like? You know, this is the question that uh, we might feel like we, we have the answers to because God has blessed us with his written word and with his presence. And, but there's many, many people in our world that don't know is there really a God or they don't know if he is real, what is he like? And, and of course, throughout history, this has been a question that people have been asking. I think that people are still asking these questions. I think even though we live in a society that increasingly we're hearing is, is turning towards an atheistic or agno agnostic thought process, I think that deep down in the human soul, there's this question that's always going to exist. Is there something more out there? And if there is, what is he like? I think that we, uh, we have this innate desire inside of ourselves to understand other, not just deities, but other people around us and, and to understand what, what is the nature of the people that we interact with? What, what is their character like? What, what are they like on the inside and what, are the, what is their actions gonna be on the outside? And I think the reason that we ha have such a curiosity for that in the people that we meet, um, even in creatures, you know, there's so, so much science because we desire to know, like, what are those insects like and why do they do things? And, and we have this desire to study things out and understand the nature and the character of a, of a being and what it is that they're going to do. And I think that's because we get that from God. And uh, I want to propose this, this simple way to think about it this morning that I think that one thing that God does is that he binds himself to other things or he tethers himself to other things in order to explain his character, in order to explain his action, and in order to explain his future action. And I think that we do the same thing. And this is what I mean. Uh, you know, we as, as humans, sometimes some of us in this room, if you're gonna explain yourself, say we meet for the first time, 
If you're a man, you might describe yourself based on what it is that you do for a vocation or whatever in your mind you think that you do that's adding value to this world. And that's one of the first questions that we as men ask each other is, hey, what do you do? It's because when we talk about what it is that we do, somehow it's like we're expressing to somebody else the, that that thing is going to express to you either my character or what it is that I value or what it is that I'm, my actions are gonna be on this, this planet. Other people in this room, you may be, when your first choice wouldn't be what you do for a job, but you might bind yourself or tether yourself to relationships. A lot of women do this. You know, I'm a wife or I'm a mother. Uh, you know, things like that. They describe themselves in, in relational terms. I think that that's a very godly thing to do. We're gonna see that today. Um, other, other times people, for, for whatever reason, we, we tend to bind ourselves towards the location that we came from. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but you know, people that come from LA or New York, they think that you know, there's something special about them simply based on the geographical location of where they were born. <laughs> right? And, then they did, and it goes both ways. They did this to Jesus. Can, can anything good come from Nazareth? You know, there, there's something in us that, like, there's something about a person as if the, the, the ground that they were born on has anything to do with their character. But, but we tie, we bind, we, we think about it in those terms, don't we? Even uh, Pastor J.O. sometimes, he'll say things like, he'll, he'll tether himself to a geographical location for a reason. He'll say, hey, I'm from the South. And what he means by that, as you've experienced, is that he's, he's making a declaration that in your mind, you might, you might tie somebody from the South being a Southern hospitality. And so that's why, like in this church, we stand and we welcome guests because, you know, you're from the South and that's what you should be known for. And so all to say, there are many, many different ways in which we describe ourself, our, our character and our actions by, by tethering ourselves to something else. Does that make sense? And so today I, want, today I want to look at how it is that God does that. Because it's really important to know that all throughout the scriptures and all throughout history and the story of God that you and I are, are playing in, that God has chosen to bind or tether himself to a few different things, but one thing primarily. And in order for us to... Uh, really walk through and, and discover what it is that, that we're talking about today. I want to invite you back, way back. I'm going to invite you 4,000 years back to an ancient Eastern wedding ceremony. And so I'd like to welcome to the stage the groom today, Logan, bringing the fattened calf, and his bride today, Kate and father, now I know that you guys have been to weddings before, and though the song is this, the song has never changed in four thousand years. It's interesting. <laughs> though the song is the same, the ceremony is very different than any that we've experienced. So I want to explain to you how it is that uh, a ceremony might have gone back in the east in in the biblical times. The parties would come together, not on a stage in a church building like this, but out in a field somewhere. And the groom would bring with him certain animals that were prescribed to him that he knew that he would need to bring. And then the, the, the woman would come, uh, typically with the father, and the ceremony would be, would be a, called a, a covenant commitment ceremony. And what would take place is that right in the middle of the two, somebody would dig a trench right in the ground. And then although we've heard of, of certain exchanges, uh, marriage exchanges where the man would bring gifts that he would give to the father of the bride, I think they called it a dowry. In this particular type of ceremony, the animals that were brought in were not gonna be given over as gifts, but on this day, they're gonna be slayed and sacrificed. And so what would happen is that they would take the animals And this is exactly what they would do. That's gruesome. And then they would carefully arrange the, the pieces of the animal on either side of the trench. And all of the blood 
would flow down into that alleyway. And they called that the blood path. And then what would take place is that each party involved in this covenant commitment would make declarations, declarations about their character, what it is that they stand for, and about their actions, both previous actions and what is to be expected in the future. So the man might show up and and make a declaration that, you know, I'm a man of of good character, God-fearing man. I am going to provide for your daughter. I'm going to work in the field, and I'm going to provide financially for her and for our children. And he'd make all these declarations about who he is and what he intends to do. And then the, uh, the father might come and and make a declaration about the character of his daughter and about uh, you know, her actions in the past. Say, I've, I've, I'm bringing into this wedding ceremony a virgin and she's gonna bear you, know, you many, many children. And amen, hallelujah, right. And uh, <laughs> I know Logan wants lots of kids. And so both parties are gonna make these promises, these declarations, these commitments. And then the really important part of the ceremony takes place. Oftentimes you'll show up to these ceremonies, uh, all parties wearing all white. And after they've declared their promises and their covenant commitments to one another, they're gonna walk down the blood path as a sign, a symbol, and a seal of the commitment that they're making. Now this obviously is not you know, just your average everyday contract that you and I enter into, like your cell phone contract that if T-Mobile wants to buy out Verizon, then they just pay the money and you're out. This is a serious thing. I mean, we're, we're here cutting a stuffed animal with a knife and we're like, oh, you know? But the practice was real animals with their hands, with real knives and real blood and real gruesome. It's a serious thing to step into a covenant commitment. This is the type of contract that takes place within this type of ceremony. And so it's in light of this and knowing what it is that takes place in a covenant commitment ceremony that we're gonna jump into the scriptures in the life of a man named Abram and we're gonna begin to see what, it is the, what is the nature of God, what it is that he binds himself to, and what it is that he promises to Abram and to all future generations. Will you thank these guys for coming up here? And... If you have a Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. We're gonna read a few different scriptures today. Uh, if you don't maybe know the history of, of what's going on in the scriptures so far, Genesis is the first book in the Bible, and the first 11 chapters describe the earliest history that we have recorded. And so, of course, you would find Adam and Eve there, Cain and Abel, and the first 11 chapters go all the way up through Noah and what took place in that, in that uh, time frame in, in this earth and humanity. And, and you know, I can't ex- we can't explain all of it right now, but basically at one point it says that all the hearts of everybody on the earth had be- become evil. And so, of course, you've heard of the great flood and God flooded the earth and, and, and saved a, a, a remnant or just a few, Noah and his family in the ark. And then when they got off the ark, God did this thing. He made a covenant with humanity. This is, this is one of his first covenants. Now, in the scriptures, there's, the, theologians will argue that God made a covenant with Adam and Eve, although the word covenant was not used. We see with Noah that that word shows up for the first time. But God makes with Noah this covenant that, that is not based on two parties coming to the, uh, to the covenant ceremony. It was just his covenant. He said, no matter what humans do for the rest of time, I'm making a covenant that never again ever will I destroy all of humanity. That was a covenant commitment that he made and has nothing to do with our action. And he put his rainbow in the sky as a symbol and a seal for the covenant commitment, the promise that he made. You remember that? So, and then in Genesis, going from chapter 11 to chapter 12, there's a turning point in history. What we see in chapter 12 is for the first time in history that God really shows up in a relational way, making a commitment to a specific person and a specific people. Uh, This is the first time that he's done this. And so I wanna look together with you uh, at what it is that's taking place between God and this man named Abram. 
And so we're going to pick up in chapter 12, verse 1. It says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your kindred and your father's house. That is, go from everything that you've known in your family and where you've lived and go to a land that I will show you. It's a funny thing that sometimes God asks us to to step out of our our seat, step out of our comfort zone and go somewhere that he's going to show us when we're on the way. That takes faith. And Abram, uh, he, he listened to God and he had, he had some kind of faith apparently because he got up and he went. Even though God didn't tell him where he was going, he went on the journey. And then God begins to make these promises to Abram. And he says, I will make you a great nation. That's a declaration. That's a commitment. I will bless you and I will make your name great. And I love this. There's a reason that God likes to bless his people. It's so that we could be a blessing. It says, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and to him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Father Abraham had many sons. (laughs) Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. Let's all praise the Lord right now. Okay, <laughs> let's turn to chapter 17. We don't have time to read all of it. I would encourage you this week to uh, go and read chapters maybe 12 through 18 or so. It's an amazing uh, section of scripture and so important and applicable towards uh, who, who we are and, and what we are to know of the nature of God. And, of course, Abram is the father of our faith. Uh, we, you know, we are... We believe in his line, in, in his uh, faith line, and, and that we could date that all the way back to, through Jesus, all the way back to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. And so what we're, what we're reading here in these few sections that we have time to read together is this explanation of this first relational contract covenant that God is making with a person or with humanity. And so in chapter 17, we're going to pick up in verse 1 and see, I want you to listen for a few of the terms the terms that are going to be written in this contract that God has given. What are, the, what are the expectations of both parties in this covenant commitment? It says, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, now by the way, when God first showed up to Abram, he was 75 years old and he had no children. And God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. Now, I don't know about you, but I think 75 is pretty old to start having kids. Nevertheless, God made that promise to him and he had no kids. And now here we find ourselves 24 years later, and he still has no kids. So he shows up again, he's 99 years old, and and, uh, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Now listen, here's your part of the contract. Walk before me and be blameless. Simple enough. that I might make my covenant between me and you. Covenant. And I might multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I love that. I love that God is making promises for what he's going to do. And then God goes out of his way to say that he's already done it, even though Abram hasn't experienced it yet. And sometimes that's the way God works. Is he makes a declaration of reality, even though our eyes haven't seen it yet. Because for God, when he says something's done, even if we haven't experienced it, it's done. Because God is not a man that he should lie. When he says it, it's as good as done. And he, said, he tells Abram, I have made you the father of many nations already. I will make you, verse six, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. These are the, these are the things that God's putting on himself, promises that he, he is uh, stepping into in this contract. Kings will come from you and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. Now that's an important term theologically. Uh, throughout the scriptures, there are different times when God makes an agreement with, with humanity, and there are some times where the covenant agreement is for a period of time. 
that it was set to begin and end. But when you see this term, an everlasting covenant, that's God declaring as a promise that the, the agreement that I'm stepping into is something that will never end. Everlasting covenant to be, now listen to this. I think that this right here is the, is the verse seven, is the, the pinnacle of all the promises that he's making to Abram. He says, I'm gonna make you great. I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna give you children. Nations are gonna come from you. Kings are gonna come from you. But he says this, I will be God to you and your offspring after you. That's the pinnacle promise that God is making. I'm gonna be your God. I'm gonna be the highest authority and the deity in your life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna provide for you. I'm gonna lead you. I'm gonna take care of you. We're gonna have this kind of relationship. And for your children and your children's children, that's my promise to you. And all you have to do in this contract is walk before me blameless. And I will give you and your offspring after you the land of your sojourners, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Verse nine, and God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Now that's a term that though we don't actually talk about it too often in church because it's kind of awkward. It's actually a theme that is all throughout the scriptures, including the New Testament, that is extremely important. So suffice it to say today that what God was establishing with them at this particular point in history in ter as terms of this covenant is that we're making a relational agreement between the two of us and that there is to be a symbol that people can see when they look at you, they know that you are sealed to me. It's an outward sign of the inward commitment. And we understand this, this at least thematically because we do this when we get married. We, wear, we put wedding rings on each other's fingers as a sign and a symbol and a seal of the commitment that we make the day that we step into that agreement, right? It's not like the wedding ring is the, is the uh, marriage agreement. It's a representation of the commitment that we make the day that we enter into that contract. And so that's exactly what, what circumcision is. And so you start to notice that there's these, there's these, there's these terms that God is setting before Abram. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna bless you, these promises that God is making. I'm gonna multiply you. Kings are gonna come for you. I'm gonna establish this everlasting covenant. I'm gonna be your God. And your job is to walk before me blameless and to represent me to everybody in this earth that they would know that you follow me. And I wanna turn back to Genesis 15. And now I think maybe it shed light on this passage where uh, the ceremony between the two, the two parties actually takes place. And uh, maybe you've never seen it in this light before, but now knowing the, the, the custom of the time uh, of this ceremony that we just experienced with the stuffed animal, uh, listen to these, these scriptures and, and consider what it is that God is saying about his character and about his actions through what takes place. And we're gonna pick up in 15 verse six. And basically the first few verses of chapter 15, Abram's like, hey, God, you promised me this, but I have no kids. How is this gonna happen? And he's kind of wrestling through believing God and his promise. And it says that he chose to believe God. And so verse six says that he believed the Lord and that was counted to him as righteousness. We see this even from the beginning that it wasn't his, his actions, his legalism, his religiosity that made him righteous before God. It was his belief and his faith in God that made him righteous. Verse seven, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And God said to him, bring me a heifer three years old a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So God tells him to go and get the animals. Verse 10, and he brought all of these, and immediately Abram knew what to do. We see from the scripture, he's not describing the process. He's not describing what it is. We see that God told him to go get the animals, and Abram brought the animals, and immediately it says, and he cut them in half, and he laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. 
And then it says this, when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. You see, I think that Abram knew exactly what it was that was going on. There was a ditch and he brought the animals and he, he slaughtered them and he sent them up against one another. And then uh, there, there's a theologian that argues that this little sentence here that says the birds of prey came. And that's typically something that happens when there's a, a dead carcass or a body laying there. After some amount of time, the birds will gather because they're going to come and, you know, pick at the meat or whatever. And somebody I heard this week made the argument that Abram showed up to this ceremony and he was waiting to walk through the blood path because he knew the moment that the heel of his foot steps into that, he's bound unto death to the terms of this agreement. So it's a little speculation, of course, but it could have been that he's sitting there considering, man, is this really something that I want to commit to? Time had gone by and the birds of prey were circling and he shooed them away and he's considering, I believe God, but am I ready to commit in this sort of way to this covenant commitment? Verse 12, and as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram and behold, a dreadful darkness fell upon him. And the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they will be servants there, and they will be afflicted 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go with your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. What God is doing here is he's prophesying that Abram's family, the Israelites, and you probably have heard the story before, they're gonna end up in Egypt for 400 years serving as slaves to the Pharaoh there, and then God's gonna call another man by the name of Moses, and he's gonna send Moses to the Pharaoh in Egypt to lead God's people out. And so what God is doing in the midst of this covenant commitment is he's telling Abram what's going to happen, but he's saying that after 400 years, I'm gonna lead the people out. And the way that God does this, you notice if you read the scriptures later on in the book of Exodus, is that he leads them by a pillar of fire in the day and a pillar of, uh, pillar of fire at night and a pillar of smoke in the sky in the day. And this is something that God will continue to represent his presence by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire that would, let, that would be right over the tabernacle, that is the house of the Lord. Everywhere that the Israelites went, God's presence was represented by a pillar of smoke and a pillar of fire. That's how he chose to do it at that particular time. It's important to remember because of what we're gonna see right here. This is the sealing of the covenant commitment between God and Abram. Verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to you, to your offspring, I give this land from the river Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates and the land of all the ites. And so I'm sure you've picked up on really the, the crescendo of this moment. This thing that represents the character of God, explains the actions of God. Doesn't just predict the future actions of God, but declares his plan for the future actions. For when you show up to a, ceremony, a covenant commitment ceremony like this, there are two parties that are involved. And both parties much, must walk through the blood path. Both parties equally saying and declaring a promise that if I break my part of the agreement, my fate is to be the fate of those animals. I'm recognizing today as I walk through the blood path that if I break my promise, I deserve death. And what's so beautiful about our God is that 2,000 years before Jesus, he didn't make Abram walk through the blood path. God in his grace and his love, he puts Abram to sleep and he himself passed through twice. Once for his side of the promise 
and once for Abram's side of the promise. For he knew that Abram and all of the rest of humanity, just like you and I, would be unable to walk before him blameless. He knew that we would not be able to fulfill our side of the contract. And so when the fullness of time came, he was not sitting there wondering, what am I going to do to restore humanity to me? And then he just came up with the idea to send Jesus to go to the cross. No, no, no. It wasn't that he just came up with that. It's that he indeed planned it. In fact, he planned it way long, before, 2,000 years before Jesus. He planned it from the foundations of the earth that he would send his son in our place to take the death that we deserved and he himself would go to the cross as the sacrificial lamb to pay the debt that we owed. Our God, his nature, his character is he's a promise-making, yeah. covenant-keeping. Yeah. He, that's the type of God that he is. He chooses, though he owes nobody anything. He doesn't owe you anything. He's chosen to bind himself to his covenants. This, I would say, I would argue, the covenants of God are the singular uh, highest form of his commitment and what it is that you can know he's going to do is gonna be based on the covenant that he made. We see this all throughout the scriptures and we can know it today. If God promised that he will do something, he's going to do it because he's bound himself to his own word. Amen. He cannot lie. And I just love that we have a God that would say, knowing that we, though we, we may, we're gonna fail and we may be unable even to fulfill our part of the agreement that he loves us so much, he's for us so much, he's interested in restored relationships so much that he'd say, I am going to take your place. I'm gonna receive the death that you deserved. And I just love that God did that even in Abraham, Abraham so long ago. I still wanna leave you with a simple question today. Knowing now that we have a a God whose character is one that says, I'm gonna make a commitment to you. I'm gonna bind myself to you through this promise. Whether or not you choose to or are able to walk in it, I'm binding myself to you. Now we have the opportunity to simply respond to him. We don't have to bring the animals, sacrifice them, shed the blood. We don't have to prove ourselves through legalism and religiosity and church attendance and Bible studies and this and that, all those things. We, we don't have to earn our way to God. Indeed, we cannot. We can't earn our way to heaven. Religion tries to teach humanity that there's a way to earn your way to heaven. We can't do it. But our God is the type of God that says, don't earn your way to me, I'm gonna come to you. And this is what he did in his son, Jesus. He stepped out of heaven and he came to us. And he offered us this covenant relational commitment free of charge, based on his grace, based on his love, based on his forgiveness, based on his desire to be in restored and right relationship with us. Now, you and I, we're in a lot of different contracts in our life. Some we opted into and some we didn't. We live in a, con we have in a contract with the IRS. Most of us don't like that one and we didn't opt into it, but nevertheless, we're in it. We owe the IRS a certain percentage of what we make, and that's just a fact. It's one of the contracts that we live in. We're in cell phone contracts and rental contracts and mortgage contracts, and, you know, all that, all that stuff. We live in a, in a world of contracts. And some of them you really don't like. But my guess is that if you uh, are married or one day you wanna get married, that you're eager to step into that kind of contract. Why? Because it's based on relationship. A marriage agreement is based on trusting somebody else's promise. 
That's why God values marriage so much. That's why God doesn't, you know, hates divorce so much is because our God in his very nature is a God that when he says something, he's gonna do it. And he's asking humanity to resemble him in that way. To stick with their word and their commitment no matter what happens. And so here we have a God that says, you wanna know what I'm like? I am a person, I'm a deity that makes a commitment to you and I'm willing to stick with it even unto my own death. So my question to you today is this, what type of contract have you made with him? Knowing that you are free to opt in to the contract on your own accord. What type of covenant agreement have you made with the God of the universe? If you think about your relationship with him in those terms, what is it that's written in the fine print in your contract? Have you had your lawyers add some terms in there? God, if you don't, then I'm out. God, I expect you to provide, or I don't know if I could trust you. God, I will give you A, B, and C, but D I'm keeping for the back room and midnight in my house. Have you withheld anything that he deserves from your agreement with him? Because he's worthy of it all. The craziest thing about humanity is that we have a God that should reject us and yet he accepts us, accepts us. And then we're a humanity that should so desire him and yet we reject him. It's crazy. God doesn't owe us anything and yet he's given us and offered us everything. And so what's stopping you from opting all in? Checking all the boxes, I agree, signature. Because the exchange that he's offering to us is an exchange for the fullness of life for all of the bad that we have. It's worth it. It's the greatest contract that you could ever, ever enter into. We have a God that didn't just predict what was gonna happen, but he planned for it. He planned for you. In fact, he planned for you to be here today, to hear this message as an invitation into deeper and more secure relationship with him. I just wanna invite you to bow your heads right where you're at.